uh, this workshop with, uh, and on behalf of uh, all the uh, other organizers, uh, Pablo Barillo, Cynthia Windsor, and uh, Sebastian Pokuta, and uh, Nick Harvey, I'd like to welcome you all to this uh, workshop on hierarchies, extended formulations, and matrix and matrix te techniques. Uh, it, 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 a, it, it always seems like an opportune moment to have this workshop, but this especially seems like a very opportune moment to have this workshop. The hierarchies and extent formulations have been fairly old uh, ideas, and there's been constant development on them. But over the last five, six years, there's been a ton of work, uh, a flurry of work on lower bounds of extent formulations, starting with the breakthrough work on uh, TSP, polytope of lower bounds, and uh, hierarchies, especially SDP hierarchies, are now making their way to all sorts of uh, areas like machine learning, proof complexity, uh, and uh, so as proofs have sort of uh, given as a new way to think about a lot of things. And uh, finally, the, the other theme in this workshop has been well, the future, which is like the sort of the, probably the hyperbolic programming and real stable polynomials, uh, which we're still <coughs> barely beginning to understand. Uh, and uh, so the, the, the sessions are sort of uh, have broad theme of excellent formulation, upper bounds, lower bounds, hierarchies, upper bounds, lower bounds, and polynomials, but the talks are a little bit mixed up uh, intentionally. Uh, uh, so uh, there's an open problem session on, uh, I think it's on Tuesday, uh, and what, we'll, leave a, we'll leave a sign up sheet outside, please write your names there if you are interested in posing an open problem or making just a short announcement of some result that you proved and she wasn't present here. Uh, so uh, without much more ado, I'll uh, start and uh, uh, it's a pleasure to have Walker Keibel who's going to give us a survey on constructing excellent formulations. Yeah, thank you very much. Thanks very much for the invitation and for the opportunity to uh, open this nice workshop with this overview on extended formulations uh, on the constructive side. So the organizers decided to start with the positive side, uh, with, um, not with impossibility results, but with seeing at least a little bit of what can be done. And I decided to, well, to talk, to try to talk, depending on what time permits, on these six different ways how to construct extended formulations. So, uh, one of the most classic ones is disjunctive programming. I'll go into this and present an example. Um, dynamic programming or extended formulations that resemble somehow the structure of a given dynamic programming algorithm is a very big um, tool to come up with extended formulations. Then I will talk about something that is not so well known, branched polyhedral systems. This is a kind of concept that generalizes both disjunctive and dynamic programming based approaches that we came up a few years ago with a doctoral student of mine, Andreas Loos. And then I will talk about another classical um, method, dualization. This was applied very successfully by Martin in the late 80s and came up with extended formulations for the spanning tree polytope, for example. I will talk a little bit about this and present some later results, some more recent results that have been obtained in the area of this method. And then I would like to talk about, spend a few more minutes on what I call redundant information. So this is a more combinatorial way of constructing extended formulations. I would like to talk about some recent work there as well. And depending on how much time we will have in the end, um, I will also talk about a rather specific, but as I find nevertheless, rather beautiful, um, uh, method which is based on some geometric reflections. It's not apparently not applicable in too many cases, but what it what it yields uh, at least yields nice nice pictures, and that might be a nice way to end the talk. So so we will see how far we get. But before going to these six, five or six different methods how to construct extended formulations, let's briefly um, introduce a bit into the concept. Um, it's I think the right occasion this first talk of this week. So. Um, what is it all about? It's about polyhedral combinatorics. So what do we want to do? We want to optimize over, usually in combinatorial optimization, over a finite set, a linear function. And the way out is, well, we represent the feasible solutions, this finite set as some points in Euclidean space, and take the convex hull because this is more applicable to, to algorithms. We can hopefully 
represent the convex hull with fewer data than by just listing all these points. And well, if we do so, we can apply a lot of nice theory and algorithms. So of course, everything relies on this trivial fact that maximizing a linear function over a set is the same as maximizing it over a convex, the convex hull, as the convex hull we saw on the previous slide. And we can apply all kinds of structural results. We know, first of all, that you can always do what I did on this previous slide. You can always describe the convex hull by some finitely many inequalities. Not too deep a result and not too new either. And what can you do if you have such an inequality description, so a description in terms of a polyhedral set? Well, you can apply, for example, LP duality. And this is already, though not being too deep either, it really gives some structural insight in many, many situations, also for the combinatorial problem. So this is um, at the heart of what is known as polyhedral combinatorics for the, for the nice part of the world of combinatorial optimization. And then, of course, we have LP algorithms to solve problems like this. Um, we have efficient algorithms in theory, efficient algorithms in practice. We even have some algorithms which are efficient in both, in both worlds. So <clears throat> the setup makes a lot of sense, and this is why it was very successfully um, uh, investigated over the last decades. Now, in many situations, as you know, it's very difficult to find a system of linear inequalities describing the convex hull. We have very good reason to believe that in many cases we cannot even come up with a decently described set. In many situations where we can come up, the set is horribly complicated. It might be very, very large. So you might be interested in well, relaxing this requirement that you describe the convex hull well by its inherent geometric structure, <coughs> requiring that you need one inequality for every facet of your, of your convex hull. You cannot do against it. And you might think, well, can I do a little bit more general? And of course, we can do. And uh, what we can do is we can formulate an extension or an extended formulation. What is this? Well, this is just a higher dimensional polyhedron like this one, along with a linear map. I call it a projection that maps this higher dimensional polyhedron to the polyhedron of interest. And <clears throat> Such a thing I would call an extension of the uh, red polytope P. So Q, this polytope, would be an extension together with the projection map. And what would be an extended formulation? That would be a concrete description of this extension polytope here. <clears throat> so a system of linear equations and equalities, inequalities maybe. And why are we, what, what are we interested in? Well, we are interested in, of course, in representing our red set by as few as many inequalities. So the measure that we have for the quality of such an extension would be the number of inequalities. We need to describe this set, and this is just the number of facets of this set. So the size of an extension is just the, the number of facets of the extension polytope. And the extension complexity of this polytope P is the smallest size of any extension. And usually, we abbreviate it by xc of p for extension complexity of p. Well, it, all this makes, makes sense because, um, well, whatever you want to do with linear programming techniques on this polytope, you can do with that polytope if you have it at hand, right? You can apply linear programming duality. You can solve the problems that you would like to solve, so the, the optimization problems. So having an extension is as good as having a description in the original space. So it makes sense to, to follow this concept. And let's see whether we can, well, I go back once more, whether we can come up with something that is more impressive than this. So if you count it, you see that we had eight facets in the red, for the red polytope and uh, I think six facets for the, for, the, for the extension. So we spared two facets, not too many, not too interesting. Let's see whether we can come up with more interesting examples and one of the nicest examples and, mo and most simple to explain to me is this one due to uh, Bob Carr and Konyovod. Uh, it's for describing what we call the parity polytope, so the convex hull of the 0, 1 vectors of length n with an even number, yes, an even number of ones. So the convex hull of the even 0, 1 vectors, you can rather easily describe by cutting off every odd vertex of the hypercube. Doing this, you need 2 to the n minus 1 inequalities. And here's a very, very small extension of size only 4n minus 4, so a linear size extension. And it works like this. 
you represent the blue 0, 1 vectors down here by paths, ST paths, in this network. And whenever you encounter a 1, you just switch the layer. And because I placed S and T in the same row, we, this, this only works for the, for the even uh, number of numbers of 1s. So obviously, every even 0, 1 vector can represent it this way. There's another one like this one. And obviously, we can describe the paths, the, the, the ST paths in this network, easily by, just by flow constraints. So how many, many non-negativity constraints do we have? Well, as many as we have arcs here. And this is 4n minus 4, if you count. And so let's briefly think about the projection. What would be the projection that maps this path polytope to the, to the parity polytope? Well, let's say, how do we obtain this coordinate? Well, we just sum up the two variables corresponding to these crossing arcs, right? So this is obviously a projection that yields the, the parity polytope. So a very simple, very easy example, uh, bringing you down from a description of size 2 to the n minus 1 to a linear size description of size 4 n minus 4. Still, not too many people are interested in optimizing over the parity polytope. There is also very easy algorithms to optimize over them, but it's a nice example of demonstrating the power of projections. Uh, as a side remark, you, you know, you may have encountered the power of these projections in, in a reverse way. And in, 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 when you look at fourier motzkin elimination, if you try to compute, let's say, <coughs> uh, the, the convex hull of a given point set, you know that during the process of fourier motzkin elimination, in between, you might have your data set explode. And what we do here, what we try to do here in this extended formulation is just to go the way, to, to exploit this apparently horrible phenomenon. It's a horrible pheno phenomenon for Fourier-Motzky elimination, but maybe we can exploit backwards this horrible phenomenon in, in, in our favor. And this is what we do with the extended formulations. We start with a horrible thing, this parity polytope, an exploded polytope, so to speak, and we represent it by a very harmless polytope which, if you apply fourier motzkin elimination in the wrong way to it, uh, ends up with this horrible thing, right? So this is, uh, we try to uh, turn this uh, horrible phenomenon into our favor. So this is not too interesting, maybe. Maybe more interesting is another very nice and classical extended formulation that is not, not very well known, but it's a good opportunity to, to present it to you. And it's for the completion times polytope. So for this polytope, you are given uh, and jobs with processing times p1 up to pn. You see the jobs numbered from 1 to 5 here. And you search for a schedule. This is just a permutation. We have a single machine of these jobs like this. First, you process job 4, then 1, then 5, then 2, then 3, for example. And <clears throat> for each job, you are interested in its completion time. So for example, the fifth job has a completion time, which is the sum of these three processing times here. And <clears throat> you look at the completion time vector for a specific schedule, and now you search for a best schedule with respect maybe to some weights on the, on the jobs. So what you are interested in is you are interested in the convex hull of these completion time vectors, denoted by P, C, T, P1 up to Pn here. And it is well known due to Keran how to describe this polytope. You can describe it basically by these inequalities. It's not too important to decode what is written here. It's only important to see that for every subset of jobs, you have one inequality. So again, 2 to the n inequalities. And here is a very nice extended formulation, <laughs> which is due to Woolsey. It's unpublished. He mentioned it, I think, in a talk at an ISMP some 30 years ago. And well, the extension is just a 0, 1 cube. A 0, 1 cube of dimension n choose 2. And what are the variables associated with this space where this 0, 1 cube lives in uh, meant to, meant to encode? You have variables, let's say, yij. And yij is just meant to encode whether job i is done before job j. Right? Now, if you really want to look at these feasible y vectors that could arise this way, you end up with a horrible polytope again. You end up with a linear ordering polytope, which you cannot describe. So the variables are only intended to mean this. And the nice thing is, if you project the cube with the correct projection, it's written down here and it's easy to come up with after you know what the variables are supposed to mean. If you project the cube according to this projection, 
then you find that those vertices, which do not belong to the, uh, to the, to the, to the linear ordering polytope, they fall into the, uh, uh, the completion time polytope. Yeah? So you really get a very simple extended formulation, just a cube, a 0, 1 cube, with an appropriate projection. So what you see here is that this completion time polytope is a zonotope. So it's a linear image of, of a regular cube. So this is well known for the permetahedron, right? The permetahedra, permetahedron is a special case with, all, uh, with equal processing times, equal to 1. And so it's a very nice observation due to Woolsey. And actually, the proof of this just reflects uh, this Smith rule that you apply in order to solve the problem. So it's a very nice extended formulation, which is unfortunately unpublished. But now you know that it's there. OK, this is two uh, rather ad hoc examples. And now let's become a little bit more systematic and look at the different methods how to construct extended formulations. And let's start with uh, item two, so disjunctive programming. So this is a very, very simple concept. It's just this. Suppose you have five polytopes, like these five dark blue polytopes, and you're interested in the convex hull of the union of them, so the lighter blue object here. Then Balazs observed already in the 70s that it's pretty easy to come up with an, with an inequality description of an extended formulation for this convex hull. The size of this extended formulation Balazs came up with is just the sum of the sizes of the descriptions of the individual polytopes you feed into the construction. Very easy construction. So basically, just you, for every polytope here, you introduce a separate set of variables. You write down the inequality system describing the polytope in its own set of variables. You add another homogenization variable. And then you write down everything. And you link the homogenization variables by requiring that their sum equals 1. So you get an extended formulation which has as many inequalities as you see in all the descriptions of the five polytopes, so the sum of the extension complexities. It also works if you have just an extension of this polytope. It doesn't need to be a concrete description in, this, in the original space. So, But this is very, very useful to come up with extended formulations in special situations. And um, despite the construction being very, very simple and very easy to, to establish that it works, it can be used very fruitfully. And here's one example I'd like to uh, show to you. It's from some work we did together with Dirk Oliver Theis, whom I saw from the distance over there, and Kostya Paskovic, who maybe is here as well, some years ago. And it's about describing the polytope that is associated with the matchings in a complete graph with a prescribed number L of edges. And here, let me briefly explain how, how this disjunctive programming setting is exploited here. So we are interested in the matchings of size L in the complete graph. So this is the polytope associated with the matchings of size L. And of course, we know from Edmund's work that we can describe the matching polytope by these blossom inequalities, again, exponentially many, exponentially many in the number of nodes. And if we just add the cardinality restriction, that's fine. So can can be done. <coughs> so how can we do better? Well. <clears throat> Here's the strategy. We cover the set of matchings of size L with, a few, with, with some subsets of, of these matchings of size L. Then for each of the subsets, we find a small extended formulation. And then we just do the disjunctive approach, take the convex union of the, of the, convex, the convex hull of the, of the union. So what is the subproblems? Well, the subproblems is the set of matchings that we call colorful. What does this mean? Suppose we spend two L colors to the nodes in some way. Like this, here we have, I think, six colors spent. So L is three in the example. Six colors spent arbitrarily to, to the nodes. And now we call a matching colorful if it uses exactly one color from each color class. So this would be a colorful matching. This would be a colorful matching. Actually, I did not bring a non-colorful matching, but you can imagine what is a non-colorful matching. <clears throat> so this is what is the colorful matching. And the nice thing is, ah, another colorful matching. No, oh, I brought it. Oh, here is a non-colorful matching. So you know you very well understand the concept of a. Sorry? Yellow is matched, but there's two red. Yeah. There is two red. There is two red. So and yeah, and there's another another reason for not being colorful is that yellow is missing. 
Each edge should have two different colors. Well, we have two L colors. And a matching is colorful if exactly one node out of each color class is used. So every color class is used, and no color class is used twice. And you, have, you see the obstruction in two different uh, 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 places here. OK, now the nice thing is that if you want to describe the polytope for a given coloring, the polytope of the colorful matchings, you can do it in the same way as Edmonds did, but you only need a blossom inequality for each odd subset of color classes. So let's look at it pictorially. So first of all, you have uh, the restriction that you are not allowed to have an edge inside one color class. This is the first set of equations. Then you have the, the degree constraint. Out of each color class, there must be exactly one edge leaving. That's the, degree constraint for the, formulated for the color classes. And then you have these blossom inequalities. And now you have for each odd subset of color classes, you have one blossom inequality. Not too hard to prove that this works. And this describes exactly the set of colorful matchings for this particular coloring. And of course, now, here you only have um, 2 to the 2L, well, roughly exponentially in L many inequalities rather than exponentially in in the size of the graph. So you save something as long as L is small. And we will choose L logarithmically in the end, so it's polynomial size. Now, this was the first thing. But now we have to ensure that we come up with only few colorings, such that every matching with L edges is colorful with respect to at least one of the colorings. And this is well known as the problem of uh, finding or using an NK, in our case, N2L perfect hash function family. So in our setting, a set of colorings with two L colors is a perfect hash function family if it does what we want. So every, well, it does even a little bit more, every subset of two L nodes is colorful with respect to at least one coloring. If we come up with a set of colorings that satisfy this, then certainly we are done with, with, our, uh, with all our matchings. And fortunately, so this explains just the concept. Let's go through that. Fortunately, there are very small sets of NK, in our case, N2L perfect hash function families, namely of that size, 2 to the O of K. K is, in our case, 2L times log N. N is N, the number of nodes, the size of the ground set. And this is due to Alon, Euster, and Zwick some 20 years ago. So this is meant to indicate where the log n factor, factor comes in naturally. I just browse through it briefly. Then you maybe get an idea where the log n comes through. But I don't want to spend more than 10 seconds on this. So it's just if it, so this is 8, the ground set of size 8. Now if you arrange the ground set in this way, and we do it for k equals 2, we easily come up with a perfect hash fun, uh, family function of size 3. This is the first family, the first, the first function, the first coloring, the second coloring, and the third, corresponding to the three, pairs, three uh, sets of opposite, three pairs of opposite facets of the cube. So this is where, how the lock comes into play very naturally. OK, so now we have this. And let's uh, wrap it up. So for a particular uh, uh, number L, we see that we can write down our polytope as as many the convex hull of as many colorful matching polytopes. Each colorful matching polytope can be described by that many inequalities. So this is the blossom inequalities on the color classes. And this is the, the remaining stuff, no negativity on the, on the edges, roughly. So if we multiply everything, we've come up with an extended formulation of size 2 to the OL, n square log n. And now if we choose L to be the logarithm of n, we see that this is a polynomial number. So we get a polynomial size extended formulation of the L is a log n matching polytope. And this is kind of a bit surprising, because we know from Thomas Nye's work that for the polytope associated with all the matchings, we cannot hope for something like this, right? So the extension complexity is bounded exponentially from, from below. In fact, at that point in time, when we did this with Kostya and with Dirk, uh, this was interesting, because at the same time, we could prove that there is no polynomial size symmetric extended formulation for this polytope. So this result showed that there are situations where it really makes a difference 
where you whether you impose symmetry requirement on the extended formulation or not. So that was the reason why we thought about log n matchings at that point in time. Today it was just to, in order to demonstrate to you the power of disjunction, how, how you can use disjunctions to come up with interesting extended formulations. Now let's go to the third point, dynamic programming. Um, <coughs> Well, dynamic programming, what is dynamic programming? It's a very broad topic. So in, in our setting, it's, it's roughly a dynamic programming algorithm. The dynamic programming algorithms I would like to consider is algorithms that you can formulate as finding a shortest or longest path in an acyclic directed network. It might be a hypergraph, this network, we will talk about hypergraphs briefly in, in a minute, but just in just dynamic programming algorithms that you can formulate in, in this setting, like for example, for the knapsack problem or whatever, whatever you know, we'll have a different example on the next slides. So <clears throat> here is the example I would like to talk about. It's about, we talked about matchings of size L so far, now we talk about cycles of size L in the complete graph and try to describe the polytope associated with the cycles of size L. And let's see whether we can do for L equals log N something similar as we did for the matchings, and we can. And here is how it goes. Again, we work with colorings. Now we work with colorings with, with L colors. Uh, again, we see six colors, now L is six. Oh, I think I called it K now. I think, I, I think we speak about cycles of size K. So the, the length of the cycle is six in, in these examples. And look at a specific coloring of the nodes again, and call again a cycle colorful if it visits every color class exactly once. So this is a special type of cycles of length K, I think. No, L, L. So the length of the cycle should be L. So one, for this coloring, some of the L cycles are colorful. Now, how can we describe for a specific coloring the polytope associated with the colorful cycles? We do it this way. So again, first of all, there is another colorful cycle. And here's how we do, how we describe for a specific coloring the polytope associated with the colorful cycles. First of all, we enumerate via disjunctive programming over every node that, might be, uh, that we might fix to be in the cycle we consider. So let's only consider in this explanations, those colorful cycles that use this specific red node A. And then we enumerate over all the N nodes and do this junction. Okay, we get another factor of N this way. But let's just look at the colorful cycles that use this node A. So how can we describe them? Well, we can describe them or we can identify them with the A1, A2 paths in an extended network. What are the nodes in this extended networks? The nodes are pairs of original nodes in the graph, like this G, and subsets of the colors. Well, so why, why is this enumeration polynomial? This I didn't understand. Uh, I just enumerate over, I, well, first of all, I describe all the colorful cycles that use node A. Then I describe all the colorful cycles that use node, what is this? I. Sure. I. OK. And this is only N nodes. Ah, OK. This is only n nodes. And this is another factor of n. OK, we represent these colorful cycles that use node A as paths in this extended network that I described. Paths from this artificial node A1 to this artificial node A2. Well, what is a non-artificial node? So, and the, the true nodes, they are composed of, they are pairs of original nodes and subsets of colors. And we have an arc connecting, let's say, this node to this node in this network. Why? Because these two color sets are almost the same, except for this color set additionally has the color of this node. Yeah, that's the rule, how we define arcs in this network. And then you see that in this network, you find this cycle as this path. Not only at this path, also as this path. This is just the reverse cycle, of course, but I don't care. But all the cycles you find as, in fact, two paths in the network, right? And of course, the paths in this network, we can again describe by means of just uh, 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 flow conservation constraints. There is another cycle with another path, and the reverse path 
once you have the tick Z code to produce these figures, it's fun to produce a few more. <laughs> and also, it's only worth to produce a tick Z code if you produce a few more pictures. <laughs> Otherwise, it's not really worth it. So that's the construction. <laughs> and this is why later in the talk you will only see handwritten, hand-drawn <laughs> figures. <laughs> okay, but for the time being, we are still in the, in the good old days where I use these TIG-Z stuff. Okay, so this is how we represent the cycles. And, well, what is the projection? It's easy to imagine, right? What is the, how, how, how we, do we obtain this edge as a project or the variable? Um, how can we represent the variable associated with this edge in terms of the variables associated with the flows or paths in this network? Well, it's just the sum of the variables that correspond to, in, in any situation, to these two nodes, right? So this is a projection. And so what we see is that our PL, so the polytope associated with the cycles of length L, is a convex hull of that many colorful cycle polytopes with prescribed nodes. So this is the additional um, factor n here. And 2 to the OL times log n, again, comes from this perfect hash function constructions due to Alon, Juster, and Zwick. And we saw, this is what we saw on the previous slide, that each of these colorful cycle polytopes with a prescribed node has an extended formulation by means of this directed network of that size. So, and here is where dynamic programming came into play. So, this network that I displayed to you is the network that is behind a dynamic programming algorithm to, uh, to find, a, let's say, short, uh, shortest, a cheapest cycle of length L. Well, in this situation, a cheapest colorful cycle with a prescribed node of length L that you would do by dynamic programming the dynamic programming algorithm that is just finding the shortest path or a cheapest path in this directed network that I displayed to you. Yeah? So this is um, how you trivially, more or less, if you have the algorithm, trivially um, translate the algorithm into an extended formulation. So I didn't present the algorithm to you, but now you know the network and the algorithm is just the shortest path in, in this uh, acyclic directed network. Okay. Now, if you, again, put everything together, you find that the extension complexity of PL, so the cycle poly, the length L cycle polytope is bounded from above by 2 to the OL times n to the 3 log n. And again, if you choose L equals log n, you see that this is polynomial. And again, we know this is slightly surprising because we know that for the polytope invo involving all cycles or maybe the Hamiltonian cycles, whatever you like, the extension complexity is bounded from below exponentially again or sub-exponentially, certainly not, it's not polynomial. This is this uh, breakthrough paper by Fiorini, Massard, De Wolf, Tivari, Pokuta that also was mentioned in the, in the introduction to the entire workshop. Okay, so this is an example of how you can translate dynamic programming algorithms. Now, in some situations, the dynamic programming algorithms, they do not work with simple directed uh, graphs, but with directed hypergraphs. And also for this situation, you can deal with this situation, at least in some special cases. And this was uh, worked out by Martin, Radin, and Campbell in 1990. So if you have a directed network, a directed hyper network, that satisfies a very crucial, uh, um, uh, um, that satisfies a very crucial condition, then the flow, net, the, the flow conservation constraints just describe the convex hull of the hyperpaths in that network. And what is the crucial condition? The crucial condition is this. So suppose you have a hyper edge with you have a single tail, V, and this three node head set of this hyper arc. Then the crucial condition is that those nodes that you can reach from W3 must be different from those that you can reach from W2. So you're not allowed to have a, a, hyper, a hyper graph um, that uh, would uh, re rejoin paths. If you allow for that, you readily run into problems that by which you can uh, into, yeah, into problems by which you can model stable set problems and so on. So if you have this um, additional condition, 
for all the hyperarchs, then you can come up with a similar extended formulation. But al also only in this situation you can um, really model your problem by finding a path in this hyper hypergraph, right? So if the dynamic programming algorithm works like this, then you can translate directly. Okay, now let's see. Um, Let's only very briefly mention what these branch polyhedral systems are. I would not explain them to you, but um, it's, it's a way to generalize, to have a common generalization of both this dynamic programming and this um, uh, disjunctive approach. And well, the setup is just like this. You have again a governing um, directed graph structure, an acyclic directed graph with a single source. And now you have associated with every non-terminal node, you have associated a polytope in the space associated with its out neighbors. Let's say you have associated a 0, 1 polytope with, a, um, with every, with every uh, vertex. You have associated a 0, 1 polytope that lives in the space that is indexed by its out neighbors. And if you have this, this is for node V, the, subs, the set of subsets of out neighbors that make the vertices of the polytope that is associated with this node. And now if you again have a special condition that's similar from the condition that we had on the previous slide, that well, in this graph here, if U is an out neighbor of V and W is an out neighbor of V, then the set of terminals you can reach from W must be disjoint from the set of terminals you can reach from U, otherwise you are in, in, in a lot of complexity theoretic trouble as well. If you have this additional condition, then you can do something, then you can define feasible, a, a polytope associated with this combinatorial, complex combinatorial structure. You can define a polytope which lives in the space of all the nodes, and you can come up with an extended formulation for that polytope. And this model you can use for example, to reproduce the disjunctive programming case, also to reproduce the, uh, the, um, the dynamic programming case. And in principle, you could do more, but I don't have um, applications for what you could do in principle more, but I, I'd like to tell you what you could do more in principle. So for, this, for the dynamic programming situation, the only situation we can handle this way with, with what we had on the previous slides is the situation where every state of your dynamic program, in every, sta every state of your dynamic program is computed, of course, from its predecessor states, but in a trivial way, by enumerating all kinds of possibilities somehow of the outcome of the essential uh, uh, previous states. Now, if you might, might have some dynamic programming algorithms where you compute the state the, the, where you compute the current state as the outcome of a more complex implicit uh, combinatorial optimization problem in the outcomes of the previous states. You might think of something like this. If you have something like this, then this framework would cover this as well. So whenever you are in the situation that you have a dynamic programming algorithm of this weird kind, and you would like to come up with an extended formulation from that, you might want to use these branch polyhedral branch combinatorial systems. Okay, but <clears throat> let's leave it at this level of detail for the moment because I'm more, I really want to go a little bit more into these, especially these uh, techniques of dualization and of applying redundant information. So first of all, let's talk about this dualization technique which goes back, as I said, to Martin late 80s, published early 90s. And this is roughly based on this following uh, observation. So the extension complexity of a polytope described in this way. So as Ax less than or equal to beta times the all one vector. <clears throat> so all the right hand sides are beta. This is important for this approach. All the right-hand side are the same beta. The extension complexity of such a polytope, or polyhedron, is bounded from above by the extension complexity of the convex hull of the rows of A, plus one. Why is this? Let's see why this is. And this, the reason for this inequality is just LP duality. 
Let's write it down. Well, we want to characterize when we have a x less than or equal to beta times the all one vector. And well, of course, this a x less than or equal to beta times the one vector is equivalent to the maximum, uh, <coughs> the maximum of a t x, where a runs through all convex combinations of these inequalities, is less than or equal to beta. Right? This is, this is trivial. Now, if you have an extended formulation for the convex hull of the rows, like this. So this is the extension. It's described by CB less than or equal to D, this inequality system. And this is a projection. B is a projection matrix, the matrix that makes the, the linear map. <coughs> Suppose you have an extended formulation of the convex hull of the rows of A, like this. Then you can rewrite this as well. You just <coughs> replace the condition A is in the convex hull by replacing A by BB. And you end up with, with this here xtb times b. Condition is cb less than or equal to d. And this is equivalent to what we would characterize for this x. And now by LP duality, the maximum of this linear program is less than or equal to beta if and only if there is dual variables y associated with the inequalities in this extended formulation of the convex hull of the rows of A. So if there is dual variables, that prove that the maximum is less than or equal to beta. So dual variables that satisfy this equation. And this condition on the relation of the dual to the claimed upper bound. So what we have in this extended formulation is we have the variables y, which are associated with the rows of this extended formulation of the convex hull of the rows of A. And we have this one inequality that relates, this is this plus one, that relates the primal and the dual value. The primal, well, the, the, dual, the dual value and the bound on the primal that I would like to establish. So this is a simple observation. It's just LP duality. And now, how can you make use of this? Well, let's make use of this uh, at the example of the spanning tree polytope. This is exactly what Martin did in his paper. So you know that the spanning tree polytope is described like this. Roughly, you have these rank inequalities x of e of u less than or equal to u minus 1 for all node subsets. Let's say we talk about, well, let's, let's talk about arbitrary graphs. So this is um, even holds in even more, more general context, of course, in the context of matroids. But this is certainly the spanning tree polytope. We know this from Edmund's work. And now let's rewrite this condition slightly. So x of e u less than or equal to u minus 1, we can write in a more complicated way. So this is a characteristic, the incidence vector of the node set u. This is the characteristic vector of the edge set e of u. Well, I call it f. Well, this is because I now even impose the inequalities for every subset f of e of u. The inequalities are weaker then, but it will be advantageous soon. So this is just characteristic vector of node set u. This is characteristic vector of edge set f. f must be some edge set that uh, has end nodes only in u. And now if I multiply it with this vector, the minus 1 vector uh, in the node space, appended the x vector in the x space, then that should be less than or equal to minus 1. This is exactly this inequality if I write f, if I choose f equals e of u. You see this? So it's just a rewriting of the of the inequality in a more complex way. And now I observe that, well, if I choose arbitrary subsets of, F e, uh, of e of u rather than the entire e of u, which would be exactly the translation of this inequality, then the inequalities remain valid because the left-hand side only gets smaller. So this certainly is equivalent. And now let's investigate this condition here. So let's write down all these inequalities. And let's tr uh, treat this with the theory of the previous slide. So beta now is minus 1. So what we are now interested in is the convex hull of the rows of this matrix A, so the convex hull of these pairs of characteristic vectors. So pairs of characteristic vectors of what? Subsets of nodes and subsets of edges inside that node set. But not all of them. Not all of them because. We have this condition. 
We have the condition only for the non-empty node set. For the empty set, u, the condition is not true, right? We have a minus 1 here, and nothing can be less than minus 1. Minus 1 is smaller than 0, right? I mean, no non-negative variables can sum up to something which is less than 0, right? So the inequality is not valid for u being the empty set. So in the convex hull, we have to exclude the empty set. And this is a pity, as it turns out. So we call this the non-empty subgraph polytope. So it's a convex hull of the pairs of characteristic vectors of subsets u of the nodes, non-empty subsets u, and characteristic vectors of arbitrary subsets of edges running inside this chosen set u. Now let's see how we can describe the uh, non-empty subgraph polytope, because due to what we had on the previous slide, we know that the extended extension complexity of the spanning tree polytope is at most the extension complexity of this non-empty subgraph polytope plus e plus 1. This is the other constraints that we have here, the non-negativity constraints on the, on the edge variables, and then this plus 1 from the previous slide. So let's see how we can describe the non-empty subgraph polytope. And here is the easy part. So describing the all subgraphs polytope, so if we include also the empty set, is very easy. You just write down these inequalities. So the edge variable, each edge variable is bounded from above by both of its corresponding node variables. That's all. Why? Well, because this is a TU system. Every row has a 1 and a minus 1, so we are done. And if it's a TU system, this is integral, and it's easy to see that this is exactly what you want to have. But now you have the empty set included. Now we have to get rid of the empty set, unfortunately, right? Because this is a very, very small uh, formulation. It is just of roughly of size. Uh, number of the edges plus, well, plus number of nodes or something. It's, it's O of number of edges, roughly. It's a linear size description. But we have to get rid of the, of the empty set. And the only way we know how to do is we just enumerate over every vertex, prescribe it to be in the set. So we go to the face, one after the other. For each node v, we go to the face of this one, defined by z, v equals 1. We take the convex hull, balash, the union, and we are done. At the cost of, well, a factor of number of nodes. So now this description is number of nodes times number of edges, and that's how it is. But at least we have this, so we find that the extension complexity is <coughs> bounded from above by number of nodes times number of edges. So edges and nodes and some constants and so on. So this is what Martin did. Now, what we did together, did together with Michele Conforti and uh, uh, two of my former PhD students, Stefan Welke and Matthias Walter, we investigated what is a description of the non-empty subgraph polytope in the original space. And it turns out, oh, so this is just, as I said, what Martin proved. Sorry. It turns out that you can describe the non-empty subgraph polytope in the original space by the inequalities, of course, that we have for the all subgraph polytope, and one inequality for each spanning tree. OK, you can do this. But now we are in a pretty nice situation, because again, going back to Martin's observation from the beginning, so the extension complexity of the non-empty subgraph polytope roughly is bounded from above by the extension complexity of the spanning tree polytope, the convex hull of the, uh, the, convex hull of the rows of this matrix. So what we see is that the extension complexity of the non-empty subgraph polytope and the spanning tree polytope is roughly the same. So here it is written down. This is the error between the two. So it's roughly the same. And this can be exploited by a very, very nice observation due to Sam and, uh, and uh, 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 three co-authors, Kostya, Tony Hoyne, and um, um, Joré, because if you have a graph of genus G, let's say bounded genus Mabel, maybe, then it is well known that you find square root of G times number of nodes in the graph, many nodes. After host removal, the graph is planar. Now you can describe the non-empty subgraph polytope by enumerating over all these removal nodes. And the planar thing that remains if none of the guys is in the set U. So again, by Balash, you obtain an extended formulation of the non-empty subgraph polytope roughly of that number times what you need in order to describe um, the uh, what you need in order to describe the uh, 
the all subgraph polytope, and what you need in order to describe the non empty subgraph polytope of a planar graph. But we haven't seen anything about the planar graph. But in the next chapter, we will see how to describe the spanning tree polytope of a planar graph by linear size extended formulations, extended formulation. Thus, by the relation on the previous slide, the extended com extension complexity of the non empty subgraph polytope of a planar graph as well is of linear size. So putting together all this, you find that the extended uh, extension complexity of the spanning tree polytope and also of the non-empty subgraph polytope of a graph of genus G is bounded from above by square root G times E times square root of number of nodes. So in particular, if G is a constant, it's just E times square root of V and not E times V as we had from Martin's formulation in the general setting. Okay, so let's go to the probably last chapter I can, I can treat, the chapter on redundant information. I think we will have to reflect, uh, uh, we have to skip the, leave out the, the reflections, but as I said, they are not so w applicable in, in too many situations anyway. So let's talk about this last really important, as I find, construction mechanism, which I call redundant information. So what do I mean by this? By this I mean the approach of uh, adding some variables that reflect some combinatorial information about the solutions that is redundant because it is, it is there already in the original formulation, but which cannot be expressed in a linear way in the original data. So adding some variables in order to be able to express some structural relations between the data, which is nonlinear. And I will give basically, I think, two examples to you. One is a very classical one. It's a very beautiful one due to Williams from 2001, and it's about spanning trees and planar graphs. So how can we describe spanning trees and planar graphs? So what, as I said, we will add some combinatorial information, and we will, in fact, add a lot of combinatorial information in this case. What do we do? So here's a planar graph, and once it is embedded, you know there is a dual graph like this one. Now from basic graph theory, you know that every spanar tree in the primal graph has a property that its complement, I mean the edges of the dual graph corresponding to its complement, form a spanning tree in the dual graph. This is basic, most basic graph theory. So what we do now is we consider both, not only the primal trees, but, also, but pair them with their dual trees, which is completely redundant information. You can, of course, come up with this, but it's not a linear relation. And we even add more information. We distinguish both a primal and a dual root. There is a technical condition that the primal root should be on the face corresponding to the dual root, which is just technical. Don't care about this. And now this pair of spanning trees, we even direct, make directed arborescences out of these spanning trees. So we even add more redundant information. So we look at pairs of, pairs of arborescences in this sense. And clearly this is a lot of information and it's pretty easy to understand that once you can describe all these vectors associated with these structures, you can project this down to the spanning tree polytope. We'll have the projection later on the slide. But now we try to, I think later on the, on the slide, yes. Now we try to describe the polytope, which I call PRP, of all these pairs of aborances. And it turns out this is very easy to describe. Here it is how it goes. For every original primal edge, VW, we now have four arcs, two primal arcs and two dual arcs. And we associate associated Y variables with the primal and Z variables with the dual arcs. And now we write down those conditions that come to our minds in the first minute of thinking about this problem. First condition says, out of these four arcs, exactly one must be taken. <coughs> Second condition is, this is arborescences. So unless one of the guys is roots, the outgoing arcs should sum up to one. And this is the second uh, condition two, two primal and condition two dual. And then we have non-negativity. This is already there. We don't even have to think about this. Then we observe that this is a TU system. And then we only have to argue a bit combinatorially to find that, indeed, the 0-1 solutions to the system 
are exactly our pairs. This is not too hard, uh, slightly, it's a few lines of arguing. So we have a very nice extended formulation. And how did it work? You associated more um, information to your, to, your, to your vectors, to your combinatorial structure. And in this case, you were lucky enough to end up with extended representing vectors whose convex hull you can easily describe. This is the ideal situation. This is not always the case. For example, you can also interpret in a similar way the spanning tree formulation uh, of Martin. Uh, we didn't see the variables um, explicitly here. But you can interpret the variables that come up in the following way. So again, you look at the bidirected version of your graph. And now for each node, you spend a set of variables associated with the arcs in the bidirected version. So let's say each node has a color. So now you have n colored sets of variables, so to speak. And now for every color, so for every node, you write down the trivial condition that you have on the aborescences with that root. And the trivial condition is just this out degree condition here. You write it down for every of the, of the nodes, for every of the color for every color class of variables. You write it down, and then you write down what is the projection. And you write down that the x variables associated with, let's say, an edge is just for each root. It is the sum of the two arc variables corresponding to the aborisons with that root. And that you write down for each root in your graph. This way, you bind, bind, you, 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 you bind the different aborisons together because you write down that the projection must be equal to the sum of these two, uh, uh, these two variables for each root. So implicitly, you also bind these two aborisenses together. And this is the extended formulation that works for the spanning tree polytope. But what you end up with is not the convex hull of the characteristic vectors of these, of these aborisenses. You end up with something that works, but it's not the convex hull. It's more complicated. OK, but also there, in this interpretation, you add additional information, namely, how does it look if I direct everything to, if I look at the different aborisenses that co correspond to my spanning tree? How does it look? You add this information, and you write down the conditions that you derive from that, and this is good enough for you. OK, the same trick, this is about some computational experiments we did some years ago with, um, with the planar formulation by Williams. Uh, of course, we did not compute spanning trees, uh, minimum spanning trees with that formulation. That does, that's not fun. But what we did is we looked at um, degree bounded spanning trees with that formulation and compared it to the form uh, formulation where we, um, where we separated the rank inequalities and so on. And here you see some speed ups. It's just meant in order to impress you of the practical value of extended formulations, in particular for this planar. Uh, spanning tree formulation of, uh, of Williams. But what I would like to use the remaining very few minutes for is to talk about something that I very recently did together with a PhD student of mine, Miriam Friesen. And this is about, well, polynomial spanning tree optimization. So what, what is this about? So suppose you want to solve, minimize, let's say, a polynomial in the edge variables over the spanning trees of the polytope. Of, of, of the graph you have at hand. Suppose you want to do this, and let's say this uh, script M is the set of monomials in your polynomial. So it's, I identify a monomial with a subset of edges. The edges correspond to the variables, right? Now, in order to do it with linear optimization, we look at these extended vectors. So x is an incidence vector of a spanning tree. And we have a y, y variable for each of the monomials. And this is just an, meant to be an indicator indicating whether all the variables in that monomial are in the spanning tree that we are considering. So indicating whether the monomial evaluates to 1 or not. Now we would love to have the convex hull of these extended vectors, because as soon as we can describe the convex hull of these vectors, we can do linear optimization over these extended sets. And so we can do polynomial optimization over, w at least with polynomials, where the uh, set of monomials is in, in, that, in that script M. <coughs> Usually, you will not be able to do this, of course. You will not be able to co describe the convex hull here completely. But what you can hope for is that for maybe for single monomials here, you can maybe 
describes the convex hull. There is not, no complexity theoretic uh, argument against it. For a single monomial, it's very easy to solve the optimization problem because there's not too many cases you have to consider. So for example, for single monomials, you may, might, be, might be able to describe the convex hull. And then you might be able to use the description or extended formulations for these um, descriptions of the um, individual polytopes that arise by adding a single indicator variable. You might just plug together for all the monomials that you have these descriptions and hope to, uh, that you end up with a, with a good um, relaxation. So this is what is written down here in a formal way. I don't want to go into details too much here. Just indicate to you what we can do. So of course, you can do this destructively for such a set of monomials. And what is pretty easy to see is as long as the set of monomials is a set of subsets, it's a pose set, as long as this pose set has a constant width, well, then you can come up with an extended formulation of polynomial size. In fact, you can come up with an extended formulation of size number of nodes to the width of m times the extension complexity of the spanning tree polytope. And this is just due to Dilworth theorem. You de decompose your, 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 your set of monomials, your pose set, into, into chains, as many, you need as many as the width of, of m is by Dilworth. And now you enumerate overall possibilities where in each chain the first edge is, is not in the solution. So it's an easy enumeration argument. But it's a huge number usually here. So let's see wh whether we can do better, for example, if we have just one chain. And the case of one chain implicit not, is, is a special case of what has been done by Fisher, Fisher, McCormick last year, uh, even in the general case of matroids. And in the same setting, in our setting we had on the previous slide, what they can do is they can describe for a single chain, for a single chain of monomials, they can give a complete description of this indicator polytope. It involves the McCormick inequalities, not this McCormick, but the, the older McCormick inequalities, and some modified rank inequalities here. But it's a huge description, of course. You need for all the subsets here, or, or kind of um, um, subsets uh, that you plug together, you need an inequality. Um, and the question is whether we can do something with extended formulations here, we can do before just indicating to you that we can do something. Let me mention that this study, these studies were initiated by Buchheim and Klein and, and Fischer and Fischer, initiated by Buchheim and Klein, and they treated the case of, of a single pair of edges, of, so just a product of two edges for the spanning tree. And what we can do is we can come up with an extended formulation, which, let me briefly go back. Instead of having this size, so v to the, um, well, the v to the width of m, now we have a single chain, so v times number, uh, so v times extension complexity of the spanning tree polytope, we can come up with an extended formulation which has extended formula, uh, extension complexity of the spanning tree polytope plus, in this case, m, m bar, let's say this is v, this is the size of the largest monomial, times e. So instead of multiplying this by the number of nodes, we have just plus v times e here. And this we do by using the variables that I indicated to you that we, you would uh, have in the Martin formulation. We use these variables and find that they pretty much have to do with the product variable. So with the variable, let's say, y that indicates whether the entire set of the monomial is in the tree that we are considering. They very much have to do with these variables, at least in the special case that our chain of monomials is in fact a chain of trees. So we need that it's a chain of trees. It's not allowed to be disconnected. This is a special situation. We can also deal with a, with a disconnected case at least in case we have a product of two variables. Also for this, we can come up with a very small extended formulation by means of these additional variables. They have a combinatorial meaning. And the last thing I just want to mention to you is, now what you would like to do, if you can describe the indicator polytopes for a pair of variables or a pair of adjacent variables, in this situation it's, it's easier, what you would like to do is you would like to do this also, of course, as I said, if you have several pairs of, of, of variables, so not only one monomial, but many mon monomials in your, let's say, quadratic polynomial now. So for example, you might have 
the product of these two edges and the product of these two edges. Now, our extended formulation, which I did not present to you, our extended formulation for this product would use these Martin variables indicating the, uh, uh, the aborosenses. And for this product as well. Now what you observe is that you can use the same extension variables, the same variables for the aborosenses if you look at this extension, uh, at, at this relaxation coming from that product, and if you look at the, um, re um, the relaxation coming from this product. This you realize, and if you realize this and only introduce one set of aborosense variables for each node, but not different sets for each product, then you strengthen the extension, and this yields a provably tighter relaxation than by just intersecting the uh, the polytopes, the indicator polytopes for this single product and this single product. So this is just <coughs> meant to be an example where you, you see that using extended formulations for these individual indicator program, uh, um, um, uh, polytopes, using extended formulations and identifying some relations in the extension variables, can provably strengthen your relaxation over working in the original space by describing the individual polytopes. Okay, so this is, um, this is why I like so much this uh, idea of uh, combinatorial uh, information, because this combinatorial information that you have in mind, so specific pre-images of your vertices of the polytope you're interested in in the extension, that you can use in order to identify these relations. And in order not to go too much over time, I'd stop here, and thanks for your attention. I think we'll take questions offline. Uh, we'll meet again at 11.30.